So, we are looking at bilingual cognition. Bilingual cognition in terms of how different languages encode different concepts differently or sometimes same concepts differently. And we looked at how uh, different concepts like uh, gender, number and so on have all have affected language processing and sometimes non-linguistic cognition as, all, as well. So, how basically how if a language has grammatical gender, how it might affect that, uh, that person's uh, performance in tasks that do not require him to use the grammatical information at all in a non-linguistic task, but that codification that and uh, that, that uh, understanding of their concept as exemplified through the language makes the person behave in a certain way. So, now we will uh, move on to the idea of another grammatical component which is uh, called the temporal events. Temporal events primarily refer to the tense and aspect marker in a language, it is a grammatical property. Now, languages uh, differ widely across the world's languages in terms of how they encode the information of time. Uh, many of you will already be familiar with the idea of Hopi language. In fact, in the heyday of uh, linguistic determinism, this was one of the most commonly utilized examples that Hopi language does not have the time marked on the verb phrase uh, in the same way as English does. So, from looking at the verb, it is very difficult to know the time of the event. And this was taken as an example of, this was taken as a, as a pointer or indicator of the Hopis not having a fine tuned understanding of time as the English would have. So, similar findings have been abound uh, in this field. The, so, various languages use different techniques to encode temporality in their uh, grammatical structure. So, uh, for example, English marks both tense and aspect. Modern Hebrew marks only, English marks both tense and aspect. Modern Hebrew marks only tense, but not aspect, right. So, languages may differ as to what is given uh, a grammaticalized status. English gives that status to both tense and aspect. Hebrew marks only tense, but it does not mark aspect. Mandarin Chinese marks neither tense nor aspect. So, basically when you talk about temporality, there are two things. Now, English grammar tells us there are two ways of looking at time. One is the time of the action, whether it happened in the present, in the past or in it is going to happen in the future. And even within that, there are things like there are uh, ideas of simultaneity and before and continuity and so on and so forth. So, these are the various finer aspects within an event. Uh, to understand it temporarily. So, English has these kinds of differences whereas, in Chinese it is optional, in Hebrew aspect is not mentioned. So, these are some of the differences as a result of which Chinese language has been studied in um, extensively to look at how their non-linguistic performance actually uh, works out. So, in Chinese some morphemes have been uh, identified one of them is the guo morpheme, which sometimes is used as an aspect marker. But interestingly, unlike English, English has dedicated markers for tense and aspect. That is not the case in Chinese. So, they have some morphemes like this, which can be used as aspect marker, but it also has other meaning like to pass as a verb and so on. And even when these kind of aspects markers are present, they would uh, in the timing of the of an event would still be determined by the aspect marker and other factors like verbal semantics, situation type and so on and so forth. Now, this kind of background information has been uh, uh, utilized in many studies on Man Chinese speakers. So, in one particular study, this was on the Mandarin Chinese speakers, the participants were presented with a set of pictures. Now, these pictures, the manipulation was that the pictures were different on in terms of the temporality as in when did the event happened. So, either it is past tense, present tense or future tense. Looking at those pictures, the pictures can be described in English language as events that took place in the past that is taking place in the present or that will take place in the future. And this the, the task going given to these Chinese speakers were to describe each of these pictures. Remember the pictures were different, they were not the same picture, they depicted events that would for an English speaker 
would be described in terms of past, present and future tense. But Chinese, for Chinese it is not mandatory to mention. Now the study was to describe all of these pictures. What happened was when these Chinese, when the participants were not told, not given any explicit instruction, they tend to tended to use only one type of description for all. So, there was hardly any distinction between the present and the past and the future. However, when they were told that they were when they were informed beforehand that these pictures could assume different uh, kinds of temporality that there will be three temporal phases possibly then this tendency disappeared. Now, what does it tell us? It tells us what we have already discussed. There are two ways in which language and cognition in terms of bilingualism can get affected. One is the codification uh, issue and the other is the habitual thought issue. So, because Chinese does not typically code the temporality in the grammatical structure, they are typically also more prone to habitually ignore that. So, this is what, but if you, are, if you tell them that this will, this is the case and you must keep this in mind, then there is a tendency. So, basically this is taken as a good indicator of the habitual thought process in case of a language like this. Now, this kind of background studies worked as a starting point for Chinese English bilingual studies. Um, the similar kind of techniques were used in a particular uh, well known study that utilized Chinese English bilinguals. However, the interesting modification here was manipulation was proficiency level. So, these are participants who had Chinese as their L1, English as their L2. However, the proficiency level in their L2 differed. Some people, some participants were low proficient meaning they are, they are, their English was not good too good. Some people were high proficient who had high proficient use of English language. A similar kind of uh, uh, technique wa was used. So, 18 action events, right? So, basically various kinds of events, various kinds of action uh, were depicted in the cards. So, uh, blowing up a balloon, crossing a log, erasing something or writing something, various kinds of activities, basically various kinds of events, right? And all these events were shown to be performed by only one actor, which is only one woman. So, that these uh, actions were different only in terms of the action or in the in terms of temporality. So, each of these actions had three possibilities, each of the temporal phases. So, basically there is somebody is cutting a rope, has finished cutting a rope and is about to cut a rope. As you can see, so there were 18 action events and each of those 18 action events had three different temporal phases depicted in the card. So, all together you have 18 into 3, you have 54 pictures, all together there are 54 pictures. For each of these pictures, a Chinese sentence was created to describe, okay. Another 62 pictures uh, and sentences uh, describing other things and objects were also used. These kind of um, sentences are called fillers, which are not part of the actual study, but they are used for purposes of not letting the participant know what the ex exact uh, design of the experiment is. So, each participant saw a total of 80 sentences. So, all those 54 were not shown to all the participants. So, they each of them saw only 18 target, target as in those pictures that had those differences in terms of temporality of the same event. Now, the test was like this. So, each sentence had been followed by two pictures. So, one sentence, one Chinese sentence were followed by two pictures. Now, one of those two, one matched the picture, the other depicting the same event, same action in different temporal phase or a different object, right. So, there was a sentence which was followed by either a matching uh, picture uh, or another which did not match. Now, in the mismatch condition, there were two possibilities. One was uh, difference in terms of temporality, another was difference in terms of a different action depicted. So, the uh, task for the participants was to choose if the pictures and the sentence match. So, in which case, uh, what, what are the matches, what are the mismatches. So, if the picture and the sentence, first they, uh, senten the sentence was given and then the picture came in. So, the, I, the task was to press yes or no for if there is a match or there is a mismatch. This was a reaction time study. Reaction time studies are those studies that uh, look at the reaction time. So, onset of the stimulus and the onset of the response. 
the time between these two uh, is called the reaction time basically the time that the subject takes to process that information. Now reaction times are an indicator of processing difficulty if the process is easy one takes less time if the process is difficult they take longer time that is the primary um, logic of reaction time studies. Now the results showed that high proficient bilinguals had an advantage. What does it mean high proficient bilinguals they were Chinese English bilinguals who were high proficient in English. Now their judgment were closer to English judgment because they were showing more fine tuned differences in terms of the temporality of the event. So basically if they say that the picture and the sentence did not match that means they, they took even temporality as, a, as an indicator which did not happen with the low proficient bilinguals in this case low proficient bilinguals perform like Chinese monolinguals. So for them the temporal difference were not an indicator of difference but if the action depicted were different that is what they considered as different. But high proficient bilinguals they also took the temporality as a, as a marker for difference. So this is one interesting study but there are many others in fact there are uh, studies by Boroditsky and et al uh, on Indonesian English and many other such groups more or less the results show the same thing. If the language if L1 lacks um, grammaticalized tense and aspect and if they have English as their second language high proficient bilinguals showed a better grip on the temporality as opposed to low proficient. Most studies in this domain show the same kind of result. Yet another domain that has been studied in this area in order to see how the mentalized the, the internalized concepts as uh, represented through language affects non-linguistic performance that takes also motion verbs as another domain. Motion verbs are verbs of locomotion movement. So walk, run, jump all of these in English language they are motion verbs. So anything that, that denotes the verbs that denote movement uh, from one place to another. Typically uh, the human locomotion verbs are used so motion verbs also is another domain where languages vary very significantly. Different languages have different ways of depicting movement. So in English you have a, we have a large number of um, words a rather rich vocabulary on of motion verbs that depict the way the movement took place. So one can uh, hop, one can skip, jump, there are various ways of no movement even walking uh, walk slither many 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 varieties of uh, words all of them mean the same thing that one object moved from one location to another location however a lot of other information is also present there so depending on what are the primary factors that the motion verbs in, uh, in a language depict languages are of two types so typically they look at the verb does the main verb the root verb encode the path information or it does not encode the path information. So in motion verbs uh, the most, most important uh, thing that, that is to be taken into account is the path information. So for example in English word exit already tells us that the path information that the object whichever whatever is moving is going away from the location that is exit. However, if you just say walk it does not give us the path information whether you are walking towards something or you are walking away from something, walking upward, walking downward nothing no information is given in terms of the path. Now in French however the information of path is there in the main root verb. So is in terms of for example you see the French sentence here and the English sentence here. So in French this basically means the person the man uh, traversed the rue. The, 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 the street by running. So this is basically an added information right. However, in this case the main verb runs this is the main verb here it does not give us the path information. So based on this depending on where in the sentence the path information is encoded languages are divided into two categories they are verb framed. and satellite framed. 
V for verb is for satellite. Satellite as in the path information can be in the this is the path information in case of English language. So, this is not part of the main root verb that is why we call it a satellite frame language right. So, this, this is the root verb and this is the root verb in French. In case of French you get the path information right there in the root verb in case of English you get the path information after the root verb. So, that is what is called satellite. So, based on this languages are of two types verb framed and satellite frame. Now, when we say that some languages are verb frame, some languages are uh, satellite frame, this has to be kept in mind that no language is entirely 100 percent verb framed or 100 percent satellite frame. It is quite possible. So, for example, I just showed you the words exit and walk. So, English has both possibilities of using a path a verb frame structure or a satellite frame structure, but it is the predominance of one structure above another that decides. Because in English, most cases it is a satellite frame structure. English prefers satellite frame structure whereas French prefers verb frame structure. So, that is why French is called a verb frame language and English is called a satellite frame language. Now, this has far reaching consequences. What consequence? For one, the, the languages like French or Spanish which have which are predominantly verb frame language, the manner information is an added information, right. For example, you see in the previous sentence that by running is optional, you may or may not use it. But in case of satellite frame language, because the path information is not there, manner information is part of the main verb. Hence, you have in English you have walks like uh, you have um, uh, words like hop, you have skip, you have jump, can go on. There are many other such possibilities. Each of them depict movement all right. There is no path information, but they each of them differ from uh, the other in terms of the manner in which the movement happened. All satellite frame languages typically will have a very rich vocabulary of manner verbs, meaning manner verbs are those low motion verbs that are rich in manner information, right. English also has a beautiful word waltz and these days there is a word that is very common among the youth swag. So, this actually comes from the word swagger. Right? So, all of these, so many various kinds of words, all of them, the, the moment you listen to this word, you actually have a mental picture of the person who is walking like this. So, this has a lot of extra added information. Now, because French is a verb frame language primarily, predominantly, French speakers mention manner when it is an issue. Otherwise, no. When it is, when it is an important uh, thing that has to be mentioned, they mention it. Otherwise, it is an optional thing. But in English, because it is a path frame language, and more chances are there for incorporating manner, so English speakers use a lot of, you know, the use use of this particular property of the language in case of communicative as well as cognitive use of this same. There are interesting differences. You will, if you if you uh, can read French, you will see the same event in the in the newspapers will be depicted very differently in English and French newspapers. English will be far more spicy in the sense that the all kinds of possibilities of words to be used. French in that way will be very bland. In any case, because of these differences, there are very interesting studies that have been carried out. So, one of them was on Greek language. Greek is also a verb framed language. So, the study was on Greek and English uh, speakers. English is a satellite frame language as we have just seen. And um, the study wanted to look at if depending on the language, uh, depending on the motion verb structure of a language of your one's language, do people attend to the same visual display differently. So, this was the study. It was an eye tracking study. What happens in an eye tracking study is uh, a machine called eye tracker is used. It, uh, it tracks the movement of one's eyes on a display as the display unfolds because eye, eye movements are largely involuntary. We do not always think and, uh, and look. The looking at an object of more often than not it is unconscious and in, involuntary. So, and that is why it is taken as an indicator of the ongoing mental processes. So, as you whatever is going on in your brain 
eyes your eye movement will be a good indicator of that. So, that is the basic premise on which eye tracking technology is based. So, eye tracker this in this study they used eye tracker to track the participants gaze while watching a series of clip art animations. And they were told before they were uh, before the experiment started they were told that they would be asked to describe the event after watching it right. It was found that the Greek participants looked at the path end point. So, the same picture were given to both the Greek speakers and the English speakers. The Greek participants looked at the path end point first and only later looked at the instrument depicting manner. Various kinds of manners were depicted, various kinds of uh, events were depicted in the scene. So, in all the cases Greek participants had a tendency to look at the path end. So, basically path became the focus, manner became a secondary focus in case of the Greek speakers. But in case of English speakers, the more more gaze was found uh, on the instrument of manner than the path information. So, there are many other such studies I have added them in the, in the references one can look up. So, basically the idea is if your language makes you look at things differently basically going back to the same idea we have been following till now how language affects your cognition non-verbal cognition. So, this is one example. However, interestingly in this study also there was no such effect when they were told to remember the event without having to describe them. This is very crucial. In fact, this has been utilized um, to theorize on this. There is a theory called thinking for speaking. So, you the, the this kind of language specific way of looking at the world gets activated if you have to speak. If you do not have to speak, then there are differences that have been observed. Same thing was found here also because they were told they will have to describe hence automatically language mediated attention took them to different places in case of the Greek and the English speakers. So, various studies have found that and the structure of motion events in L2 have affected people's understanding of the same in L1 and vice versa both ways the impact works. In a very interesting Japanese English uh, study the, um, they have found that the Japanese bilinguals who are high proficient bilinguals in English Japanese is L1 English is L2 they incorporate more manner in L1 Japanese not in English of course, English language is a manner dependent um, motion verb language, but because this, this, these people are high proficient English speakers. So, they have incorporated that information in their first language. So, that also does happen a lot more than Japanese monolinguals. This is a very crucial finding. L1 description of motion verbs in terms of manner and path are quite often not only in this study found to be affected by the L2. On the other hand, English learners of French find it difficult to convey the same level of density which is, of, which is quite expected because in English it is possible to pack a punch in terms of information, manner information in each word, each verb depicting movement. So, for example, uh, take this word slither or another interesting word slink. All you have to do in English language is to choose the perfect word and you are packing a lot of more information than your French counterparts will be able to. So, this is why the English who learn French find it very difficult to uh, you know unpack their conceptual load into the word. As a result what they do they often flout rules of French language. So, French because French language simply does not allow that kind of a structure English speakers routinely quite often do not even follow the French language rules because in English it is a lot more varied, a lot more information can be packed in. So, that was about these grammatical features uh, and how they affected non-verbal non cognition. Another important domain of research within bilingualism, bilingual language processing, bilingual acquisition and so on is the idea of conceptual transfer. Now, what is conceptual transfer? To put, to put it very plainly once uh, when we learn a new language 
after we have learned only our mother tongue whenever we learn another language it does not develop in a vacuum so there is already one language in place it has the structure grammatical structure all the grammatical properties as well as the conceptual properties already in place now whenever we learn another language after this there is already a given given system present right so it is not developing in a vacuum like the l1 develops now this has a very important role in case of second language second language be it second language third language fourth language whichever language comes after there is already a system in place so we will generalize it as a second language but it it is applicable for any language that is learnt after the first language so what happens in this case is that prior knowledge already exists and that will not sit quiet it is that prior knowledge will have an influence on the way the story goes ahead in terms of the second language or third language acquisition so this is the influence of the previous knowledge of one language on the knowledge and acquisition of another language is basically what is conceptual transfer so already the knowledge system the knowledge as in in terms of concepts as well as in terms of structure both and thirdly not uh, which is also very important the social aspect of using language so all these things are already in place and all of them have an impact on the way that new language is learned knowledge and use of the new language so that is basically what is called conceptual transfer now however conceptual transfer the term is quite new it was um, it is attributed to Pavlenko, uh, they coined it in 2010. However, there are many other terms also that have been used for the same phenomenon. Some of them are interference, transfer, cross-linguistic influence and so on. So the idea has been around for some time. Uh, the term that is used now is called cross-linguistic conceptual transfer. This goes back uh, to quite a quite a long time there are basically this uh, they, they came under the level of concept based transfer or concept based influence right so uh, one of the oldest references to um, this kind of con, uh, influence of the first language on the second is can be derived from jan's 2002 work where he uh, describes how that bilingualism in greek uh, in greece was quite common in the roman empire in the greco roman empire the elite were often the often bilinguals and so much so that knowledge of greek was considered a status symbol so the elites almost always spoke Greek and they knew Greek philosophy and not knowing Greek was considered a heinous uh, quite a, a almost like a crime we have talked about this before so the word barbarian comes from there so barbarian in Greek referred to somebody who did not know Greek language or even if they knew they spoke it pretty badly so anyone who does not speak Greek or speaks bad Greek was a barbarian so bad Greek in today's terminology will be someone who spoke with L1 reference. This is what we, can, we, we get to know from Jansi's work 2002. So this is as old as the notion of cross-linguistic influence has been around. We all know somebody, uh, you know, often we, when, when you are learning a new language, we create um, interesting structures which do not exist in the target language. So this, it is no wonder that the Greeks as they were very proud of their uh, heritage and rightly so had a, actually a word for people who did not know enough Greek. In any case, so uh, one of the oldest studies, academic uh, studies on the matter goes back to Weinreich, Uriel Weinreich, all uh, linguistic students will be familiar with his work. So his 1953 uh, seminal work on, on languages in contact, this is where he first, he is among the first ones to academically, academic research was initiated by his work and he referred to this kind of transfers, he called them interference. So transfer from one language to another was called interference by Weinreich and not only he had a uh, theory on this, this kind of, he had a structured name, he had a, an, um, the idea put forward but he also had the, a detailed discussion on the topic. 
So, he also uh, discussed methods for the identification and quantification of the differences or quantification of the interference, he calls them interference in the uh, in learning of a second language. So, how much L1 interferes with the L2, he, he had uh, theories for ide on the identification of the same as well as quantification. Not only that, he even talked about other aspects of bilingualism, how not only the structural properties of one language, but also the other aspects of bilingualism can have a role to play there, a uh, very detailed study there uh, by him. So, he developed the concept of what is called interlingual identification. Uh, this is a situation where one individual identifies the structures of two languages as same or similar. It can be conscious or even unconscious. So, all of us when we learn a new language, it, it is automatically it activates our knowledge, we, we, we kind of compare it with our L1 and see okay this is something similar and this is something different. So, that, that bit is uh, that, that is done almost unconsciously by everybody who learns a new language. So, Weinreich had a detailed discussion on this. Not only that, his idea of the, he was not talking about a one way traffic in terms of interference. So, interference he was very aware, he was quite uh, clear on this that the influence works both ways, right. So, this has been um, mentioned by Odlin in his uh, book, in his, in his, in his um, publication. So, two types of interferences that Weinreich mentions, one is called borrowing transfer and the other is called substratum transfer. Borrowing transfer is the influence of second language on a previously learned language. In today's terms, it will be a, the influence of L2 on L1 and substratum transfer is the influence of source language which is basically L1 on the acquisition of target language which is L2, right, like this. So, second language. So, as, as far back as in 1953, Weinreich discussed two kinds of influences that can work in, a, in case of a bilingual. When the person is learning a second language, there are two ways of interferences that are possible. After this 1957, Lado claimed that individuals tend to transfer forms and meanings and the distribution of that forms and meanings. So, now we will see how different researchers have pointed out different aspects of that transfer mechanism. That there is a transfer is of course already given, everybody it was already well known. Now, what are the mechanisms, what gets transferred in what way, there have been various takes on this. So, starting from Weinreich, moving on to Lado, he talked about both forms and meanings, not only that, but also the distributive structure of the same that gets transferred. How? And it, it happens in both ways, not only productively, but also receptively. Production and reception basically means the while you are speaking or versus while one understands, comprehends. This transfer happens productively when one person speaks in a second language and acts in that culture. So, we speaking English and you know uh, behaving like an English speaker that that change had that uh, that transfer happens and also that transfer is possible when somebody is a receptive uh, user of the language, receptive user as in when somebody is trying to understand, comprehend, grasp and understand the language and culture as practiced by the natives. This is what has been pointed out by Gass and Selinka 1993. Similar viewpoints were um, put forward by many others at the same time. In fact, um, transfer from one language to another in case of a bilingual were, were a rather important area of research in the 50s and this is also the time when contrastive analysis. Remember, we, we talked about applied linguistic take on language learning and uh, applied linguistic takes on language learning were heavily dependent on contrastive analysis. What was contrastive analysis? Let's take a quick recap here. Contrastive analysis looked at how language 1 and language 2 differed, what are the points of difference and it was um, it was um, proposed that those the, whenever there are differences the subjects, the learners will find it difficult to learn those concepts. So, contrastive analysis was a very important um, uh, indicator of language, language acquisition. So, this 
contrastive analysis as in the differences points of differences between two languages and combined with conceptual uh, combined with the transfer cross linguistic influence they helped each other and the, these two ideas helped each other and uh, together they contributed a lot towards second language acquisition understanding second language acquisition However, the, the, as times changed by 70s, the more empirical methods uh, took place in uh, took, uh, took the place of uh, contrastive analysis and hence a lot of criticisms also surfaced. So, some of the criticisms that I have um, noted here is that one of them was that learning difficulties could not always be predicted by cross linguistic differences, meaning that language learning difficulties are not only limited to cross linguistic cross cross linguistic differences there will be differences but that is not the only reason why somebody finds it difficult to learn a second language there are many other factors those factors were being were beginning to get noticed around this time and also many of the difficulties in learning could not be explained by contrastive analysis so this was a this was the situation after some in the in the 70s onwards so this was a very um, active field of research as you, you see. So, in the initial stages, yes, lot of uh, cooperation between these two ideas and that helped understanding uh, language learning, language second language acquisition, SLA, the field of SLA. However, new uh, with new advent of new theories and advent of empirical methods, experimental methods, it was uh, thought that uh, it was mandatory, it, it became mandatory to prove and understand transfer far more clearly. It, one cannot, uh, could not really throw the word, uh, word around anymore. So, so much so that Corder actually said that he did not want to use the word transfer just like that. He, he in fact even says that it should be banned from use unless carefully redefined. What do you mean by transfer? There are so many aspects of it. There are lexical aspects, structural, various kinds of structural aspects, but that is not where language ends. There are many other conceptual, at conceptual level also there are many layers of understanding. So, what exactly gets transferred and what does not? So, until and unless one gives a thorough refined idea about this, this should not be used it was the opinion of Corder. In fact, he famously says that if anything which can be appropriately called transfer occurs, it is from the mental structure. So, you see we are going from linguistic structure to mental structure by 90s it was already uh, mental structure that they were talking about. Mental structure is implicit knowledge of the mother tongue and that is what gets in transferred to the new language. But however, one needs to even look at the finer aspects of that. Now, Selinger in 1970s took Weinreich's ideas uh, of interlingual uh, identification and he brought in the idea of interlanguage. The idea of interlanguage was heavily used by uh, in, in applied linguistics in second language acquisition SLA, uh, where when a person is learning a new language, there are stages of interlanguages. So, the person before he gains proficiency in the second language that is a stage called interlanguage where he is. So, that is exactly what uh, Selinker was talking about and then um, uh, others followed. So, Kellerman uh, formulated the idea of psychotypology where the learner themselves they, they have a perception of the similarities and dissimilarities of the uh, different languages, differences between the languages. Now, so by 90s the focus uh, shifted from looking at errors. So, contrastive analysis where was focused more on errors, the kind of errors the learner made while learning a new language because of the differences between the uh, source language structure and the target language structure. So, error analysis was also a very important aspect of contrastive analysis at that time. But however, as we have seen that over a period of time, newer ideas came in and the focus uh, was shifted uh, or you can also say that the focus became wider. So, the wider focus now took into account the all the possible impacts that one language can have on another, not necessarily only the errors, but any other kind of impact, right. So, given all of these terms also change. So, this is called cross linguistic influence. This is to incorporate the uh, both side of the story. So, influencing from one la uh, language A to language B as well as language B to language A. Even the Sherwood Smith's work pointed out that even if there is no overt transfer always, but the very fact that the mere presence of 
one knowledge system can affect the acquisition of the other language. And cut to 1998, the term conceptual transfer comes into existence. So, starting from interferences of Weinreich going through various kinds of names and uh, shift in focus of this entire practice through cross linguistic influence and so on, finally we come to conceptual transfer. So, basically the idea uh, looks at accounts for the influence in terms of similarities as well as differences between the structural properties of the source and the target language or as they call it recipient language. So, taking into account both the similarity and the difference because it is not only differences as we have seen that um, sometimes the differences were focused, sometimes similarities were also talked about. So, today as, as things stand today both similarities and differences between languages are of importance uh, between L1 and L2. So, if you when you take that as a possibility when you when you widen your uh, focus there are many outcomes possible errors are just one such possibility. So, errors of course exist even today they exist, um, but other possibilities are also there. One is the conventional use of L2 sometimes even there are facilitation acceleration. So, help L1 also helps learning the L2 in some cases when there are similarities, when languages L1 and L2 are similar it might be helpful. Sometimes there are other things like uh, underproduction or overproduction. So, uh, errors are part of production when one speaks there are made there are errors that are made, but there, there could be underproduction as well underproduction or avoidance when uh, being conscious of the errors that one might make the participants, the, the, the learners do not uh, produce sentences, they, 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 there is underproduction, sometimes also overproduction. So, I mean all these possibilities exist, right? And sometimes there is a preference for certain structure over others, various kinds of uh, possibilities have been put forward by researchers. So, for example, uh, this particular study, um, uh, this was an acquisition of English phrasal verbs by native speakers of Swedish and Finnish. Now, Swedish and Finnish are uh, both are Scandinavian languages, but their structures are different in terms of their similarity to English. So, in case of Swedish, this is uh, this has uh, more use of phrasal verbs. Finnish, however, does not use that much of phrasal verbs. Now, the choice between if these people have to use both Swedish and uh, Finnish uh, L1 speakers when they speak in English there has been uh, a finding that Swedish people, Swedish speakers, L1 Swedish speakers tend to use more of phrasal verbs than simple verbs uh, as opposed to the speakers of Finnish. The reason being Swedish, both Swedish and English have phrasal verbs whereas Finnish has less of phrasal verbs, right. So, as a result of which Swedish is closer to English in that sense and that is why Swedish speakers are understood to be transferring their previous linguistic knowledge, right. So, this in turn facilitates their learning of phrasal verbs in English language and use them more often as opposed to the Finnish. So, in case of Finnish because their language does not use that much of phrasal verbs, they tend to use them, them less even in their L2. So, this is an example of how this works. So, the main points um, thus we have arrived at uh, within this uh, conceptual transfer, how, what are the main points that have to be taken uh, note of? One is the distance between the languages as in how similar or how uh, dissimilar the languages are. Secondly, of course, the structural properties of the languages and non-structural properties. As I said, as I mentioned before, languages have a structural property, grammatical property, but at the same time there are many other factors in case of a language. So, the society, the individual and um, various things about the individual and the society, they are all integral part of any language. That also has to be taken into account every time we look at or we are thinking of comparing L1 and L2 and L2 acquisition processes in terms of conceptual structure, right. So, similarity uh, has been typically found to be 
a facilitator. So, if their languages are similar, it is easier to learn the L2. If they are different, it is slightly more difficult. As a result, there has been two different names given. So, in case when there are similarities between the languages, this is called there are positive transfers. right? So, transfers can be of two types. If the languages are similar, it helps in learning the L2 and hence it is called, uh, it is understood to be a case of positive transfer. But if the languages are different, Hence, there is a uh, hindrance in learning the new structures and this is where it is called a negative transfer. Negative transfer typically would be visible in terms of avoidance, underproduction, overproduction as well as errors. Okay. So, there are different kinds of transfers. So, most uh, commonly we look at, uh, we, we often we, we talk about or we, we study lexical transfers, lexical transfers as in transfer of words. So, uh, Ringbaum study in 1991 uh, have talked about two kinds of transfer. One is the overt transfer, another is covert transfer. Overt transfer is cross linguistic influence may facilitate or inhibit learning if the languages are similar there is facilitation something that we have already seen. So, based on all the studies we have come to the uh, few points and on the other hand when the learners do not have adequate vocabulary they may use L1 structure in its place. So, on the one hand there are differences or similarities if the differences are there it will be difficult to learn if the similar there will be facilitation. On the other hand sometimes there is the L2 vocabulary is not even adequate. So, in that case L1 structures will take place, um, will take their place in the L2. So, these are the two things that Ringbaum talks about. Similarly, there are two other types of transfer, lexical transfer and lexical borrowing. So, both will be coming under cross linguistic influence within the lexical domain. So, there are various names given by different uh, researchers, most commonly utilized are lexical transfer and lexical borrowing. So, lexical transfers um, means that learners assume identity of the semantic structure between the words of L1 and L2, right. So, what happens is sometimes it is there is a semantic overextension. So, there are two words for uh, a good example would be in the use of uh, in case of uh, English speaking uh, L2 output of Malayali speakers. So, in Malayalam the word for washing your hair so is the word for the translation equivalent of this in Malayalam. So, basically it literally means head bath, bath uh, of the head. So, when they use English uh, in English uh, produced by many Malayali speakers rather than saying they had they would wash their hair or they will shampoo their hair they will use the word head bath. Now, in English there is no such construction. However, this is the semantic structure of the both the words are understood to be similar and that is why there is, there is an extension of the L1 structure into the L2. This is an example. Again, um, uh, a lot of uh, Malayalam speakers will, will not use, uh, we in, in English we say wear, sari is, uh, you know, we wear a sari for example. It is, however, Wearing is possible for various things, you know clothes are worn for example. So, you wear a dress, right, you wear a, one can wear a kurta. You can also wear a sari for, uh, in absence of a better word, we often use the word, the, the verb wear even with a sari. But it is very common for Malayalam speakers to say tie the sari. This is again a semantic extension of the Malayalam counterpart into English language. So, you do not say where, you say tie. However, there is yet another word that is also possible that is called drape. Right? So, these are some examples of lexical transfer. Lexical borrowing on the other hand is uh, more straightforward. This refers to the use of L word in L2 discourse. This is quite common in uh, low proficient bilinguals when they do not have the adequate vocabulary in L2, they will use the L1 word in its place. It is quite common. In fact, this is uh, something you see in uh, very often in Hindi movies, Bollywood Hindi movies, when they depict either a Gujarati or a Bengali speaking in Hindi. This is exactly what they show them doing. So, they do not know the words, so they will use the native uh, L1 words into Hindi sentences. So, that is a clear cut 
straightforward case of borrowing, lexical borrowing. Other, other uh, examples, some more examples of this kind of transfer is uh, as we have mentioned before overproduction and underproduction. Overproduction has been, uh, it, this, uh, this is from Odlin's uh, reference, he gives an example concerning Japanese students who uh, in an effort to avoid relative clauses may violate terms of the written prose in English because relative clauses are uh, usually not used very often in Japanese language. So, English language on the other hand has an extensive use of relative clause. So, they do not because they find it difficult, they find there are many errors in this domain. So, what they do is in order to in order to make up for that, they write too many simple sentences. In English, a relative clause can take care of let us say three simple sentences, but in case of Japanese English bilinguals, this is what we see overproduction of one type because there is an avoidance of another type of grammatical structure. Right? On the other hand, uh, you have um, underproduction as well. Underproduction is when uh, this has this has been uh, talked about by Nick Ellis. So, avoid using linguistic structures which they find difficult because same thing the difference between native language and the target language. So, overproduction of an irrelevant structure and underproduction of the relevant structure both are examples of influence of native structure on the new language when there are differences. When there are facilitation of course, we saw the Swedish case because Swedish uses phrasal verb it is very easy for them to use phrasal verb learn phrasal verb and use them in English language in, in when English is their L2 right. Now, we come to the non-structural factors, non-structural as in non-structural factors of language. So, in this case we have two levels, two layers of non-structural factors. Uh, one is the individual level, the other is of course, the social level. Uh, in case of individual level, there are, we have talked about this before, the age uh, factor. In, in fact, in terms of language, um, second language learning, age has been a very important um, parameter to study. So, in case of individual learners, motivation also has been um, in second language. All of these are of course, uh, relevant for second language learning. First language learning, uh, in first language learning, these are uh, already taken care of. So, motivation does not really matter. Second language because one is learning it after, later on for various purposes. So, motivation is an important factor. In fact, in second language learning literature in the applied domain or in the sociolinguistic domain, these are studied to a great extent. So, motivation of the individual learner, age of the learner, the human awareness of the language and the personality and so on and so forth, all of these will affect the transfer. So, how much of transfer happens depends on many things here. So, this is again from Odin and social of course, the context of use, right. How the, for example, the language is a social uh, phenomenon, this, we, we, we use language in different contexts. Now, the kind of mixing that is allowed in a context may not be the same in another context. For example, if, uh, if you are in a formal scenario, in a formal social context, one cannot be, one is not allowed to or let us say one is discouraged from using too much of mixing from L1 to L2. One has to try and stick to the only one, one language uh, structure. However, in an informal setup, more mixing can be allowed. So, context of use plays a very uh, important role as to how much of transfer we get to see in a L1 a, from in an L2 output, right. And also attitude towards mixing, attitude of the society. Even in informal setting, the attitude might be a, a very important marker. Typically, informal settings will allow more of mixing, more uh, freedom in usage of the language. So, whenever there is a lack of uh, you know, uh, adequate vocabulary, one can uh, use other, other methods. But if the society is not very open about such mixing, even in informal setting, it will not be seen. So, all these factors are also crucial, not only the linguistic factor, not only the grammatical factor, but also the social factor, non-structural factors like individual and uh, social factors. So, there are few studies that we want to uh, check. There is uh, one study um, uh, in 2016 by Turker 
So, this show the effect of L1 conceptual transfer on L2 comprehension of figurative expression. Figurative expressions include metaphors, figurative way of speech. Right? So, the participants in this um, were Native American English speakers who are studying Korean in a formal. So, English is the uh, L1 here and Korean is the L2. Okay? So, the task was to provide L1 equivalence of 54 Korean metaphorical expression for various emotions like anger, happiness and sadness. So, these concepts had three different tasks. Task 1 was a decontextualized out of context just the metaphor was given, only the isolated metaphoric expressions were given, another was metaphoric expressions within a dialogue. So, some amount of context and another was an elaborate context metaphoric expression in an essay. So, these are the three kinds of uh, context that were given and they were to, uh, they had to be give equivalence of this equivalence of various conceptual metaphorical sentence, uh, expressions. So, the results reveal that the effect of conceptual knowledge of L1 varied depending upon the context. So, how much of L1 conceptual clarity you had in terms of those metaphor also were dependent on the uh, number of on the proficiency level. So, uh, participants performed better in task involving figurative lang language in which L1 and L2 had similarities both at conceptual as well as lexical uh, levels. So, those kind of metaphors which basically it means that those metaphors which were present in both L1 and L2 they, they, they did better, but only in the conditions of no or limited context. In the same conditions, the study also found a significant effect of L1 frequency on L2 processing. The same study they found that frequency of L1 affected the L2 processing of figurative language. Right? Now, we see another study uh, on L2 to L1 uh, influence there have been many. So, even though the um, literature is uh, predominantly focused on L1 to L2 transfer uh, from, uh, from 1950s onward uh, even till now, the majority of studies have focused on how L1 affects L2. There are many reasons for this. For one, most of these uh, researches focus on early stages of language acquisition. So, at this stage, influence is typically from L1 to L2, early stages of acquisition in the second language. So, when one is beginning to learn in the beginner stages or intermediate stages, by the time one reaches um, high proficient stage, of course, L1's effect on L2 is very less. So, because most of the studies were focused on early stages, hence more focus was on L1 to L2 transfer. Secondly, a large number of these studies were uh, on the were focused on the immigrant communities, migrant communities typically who have migrated to uh, various western countries most typically US. So, the focus here again was on how the communities can be helped in order to achieve their proficiency level into the host language and culture. So, the focus was entirely on helping them have high proficiency in L2. As a result, L2 was the focus and whenever there was an influence of L1 to L2, it was noticed more uh, easily because L1 was not even being studied. So, even if there was an impact of L2 to L1, this was not, uh, this was totally ignored. And third was that the first, third is the belief that first language is more stable and robust. In fact, that, that idea has been uh, around for a very long time. It is only recently that new findings have suggested that one can actually have a better proficiency and more stable, stable use of L2 in certain cases, but that is a very recent phenomenon, a very recent finding. Over um, in, in the historical, historically in the 1950s to till uh, a decade back, the idea was that L1 is more stable and more strong the stronger language, the more robust language and hence no nothing will affect it. However, L2 because it comes in later, it will show more impact of the previous language. So, these are the reasons why we see less work on uh, impact of L2 to L1. Okay. However, this, this effect does exist and more and more evidence of it are now coming out. So, uh, as a result, we now know that there is a dynamic language system. 
So, when a person achieves a certain amount of proficiency in L2, it becomes a very dynamic system. There is a, there is a lot of give and take between the two languages and at various levels, which we will of course see in the, in the course of these uh, the next modules. So, and that, that uh, give and take happens across as somebody has said, it, this, there is a lot of cross talk between various language subsystems. It is not like no language is an unitary monolithic system, there are many subsystems and the give and take differs depending on the subsystem. So, keeping that in mind, there is a rather very well known study by Pavlenko and Thal. So, they looked at uh, this uh, impact of L2 on L1. So, this was study or uh, naming of common household objects in the in Russian uh, and the speakers were Russian English bilingual. So, Russian was L1. Uh, English was L2, right? And they were bilinguals. These um, bilinguals were divided into three groups. So, early bilinguals, childhood bilinguals and late bilinguals. Early bilinguals who arrived in US at a very early age uh, from 1 to 6. Childhood bilinguals, they arrived a little late, 8 to 15 years of age and late bilinguals arrived rather late between 19 to 27. As you can expect, depending on when they arrived in the US, their exposure to English language has been different. So, somebody who arrived in early childhood of course, had a lot of time because they grew up grew up in, in the US. So, they spoke Russian at home and English outside all the time. So, these are the three types of Russian English bilinguals they studied and the task was to name objects in their first language, not in their second language, but in their first language. And they, the objects were 60 images of drinking containers, glass, cup and various other things like this. And these containers were different in terms of shape, size, material and specific use. In fact, there have been a lot of studies um, in terms of bilingual cognition in uh, object classification. So, um, what is called cup in one language could be called glass in another language and a good example is the use of paper cups that we uh, nowadays are rampant in all the tea shops, coffee shops, tea shops you find those little small paper cups. So, they are called cup, but if you look at the shape and they are actually glass, small glasses. And in fact, some languages actually call them glasses rather than cups. So, now, languages differ in terms of what is taken into account uh, while naming it, while, while categorizing it as a, as a glass or a cup for example. Shape is one, size is another, material is another and also the usage pattern. So, depending on all these factors, objects are categorized and that is why they have used this kind of words and images. And then all, they also included objects that are made in US as well as those made in Russia, things that are typical of US versus things that are typical of Russia. This together they had 60 images. The results they found that effect of L2 in the naming task was observed to be the strongest among early bilinguals. So, early bilinguals are the, the those bilinguals, those Russians who came to US at a very early age from uh, age 1 to age 6. So, those people because they are in their exposure to English language, American English language has been uh, rather long. So, it was expected that they will have an influence of their English language on the Russian. Remember the task was to name those objects in Russian, not in English. All of them were naming them in Russian. So, while they were naming them in Russian, they had a strong impact of the L2. For example, calling the glass as cup, which is uh, 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 as cup because the paper cups are called cups in, in, in English. Late bilinguals showed also showed some influence but comparatively less. So, this is an example of L2 second language affecting the first language. So, transfer happens both ways, right? Transfer happens from L1 to L2 also L2 to L1 because here in this case in the Russian case, they were very high proficient bilinguals in English language. Specifically, the early uh, bilinguals are the ones who have had the largest amount of exposure. So, they have even the highest amount of impact from the L2 to their L1. So, to sum up in this segment, the general uh, generally researchers agree that transfer exists 
transfer exists. However, it is not a monolithic sort of a thing. There are uh, transfers that can happen both ways uh, from L1 to L2 versus L2 to L1. L1. However, it is it remains as a as a given. So it is a the very important um, uh, aspect of L2 learning, second language learning. Um, however, it needs to be looked at from different perspectives. So along with other, you know, the, this this needs to be looked at not only structural properties for structural properties, but also for the from the perspective of non-structural properties. Like the Russian English study, they looked at the non-linguistic factors as in how long they have lived in US and so on. And while doing so, while we are while we are at it, we are looking at uh, conceptual transfer, other factors for language learnings, other principles of language learning, language second language acquisition also need to be looked at and together they will give us the entire picture of second language acquisition. Now till here things have we have already noticed that we are moving slowly from structural properties of language in terms of cognition towards mental representation of the same. So in the next segment we will take up mental representation in terms of bilingual memory and we will discuss various theories about the same. Mm -hmm.